Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. In the next two videos, we'll talk about what buffers are, and how to make them and use them. Buffers help us control the pH of a solution, so they're crucial for lots of different kinds of research, whether we're trying to perform a chemical reaction at a specific pH, to grow cells at a pH where they'll thrive, or prepare solutions that must have a specific pH in order to be used in body fluids. To get there, we need to remember something we first talked about back in video 18, Le Chatelier's principle. You might recall that this principle states that when we disturb a reversible reaction by adding or taking away one of the reactants or products, the direction of the reaction changes in order to restore the equilibrium. If you've forgotten what Le Chatelier's principle is or how it works, this would be a good time to go back and review video 18, since Le Chatelier's principle is the most important idea we'll need in order to understand buffers. So, for example, suppose we have this reaction, in which hydrofluoric acid dissociates to form hydrogen ions and fluoride ions. If the reaction were at equilibrium, and we decided to add more products to the beaker, that would upset the equilibrium, and Le Chatelier's principle tells us that the reaction would shift to the left in order to get the equilibrium back. But think about what that means for this reaction. If we were to add fluoride ions, the reaction would shift to the left, but that means the concentrations of both the products would decrease, and that includes the hydrogen ions. So, by adding fluoride ions, we'd cause the reaction to shift and the concentration of hydrogen to go down. That means the solution would become more basic, so the pH would increase. So, how could we add fluoride ions to this reaction? One easy way would be to add a soluble salt that has fluoride in it, like sodium fluoride or potassium fluoride. When the salt dissolves, the sodium or potassium don't do anything, they're just spectator ions but the fluorine would become part of the reaction. For that reason, Le Chatelier's principle is also sometimes called the common ion effect, because the reaction shifts if we add a salt like sodium fluoride that has an ion in common with something in the reaction. Let's see an example of how exactly this works. First, suppose we have one liter of a 0 0.100 molar solution of hydrofluoric acid. As we just discussed, we'll add a salt like sodium fluoride to it in a minute to see what happens, but first, let's figure out what the pH is right now, before we disturb the equilibrium. As you've seen in earlier videos, in order to find the pH, we need to draw a rice table. Here it is. Remember, in the row marked R, we'll write the balanced reaction. In the row called I, we'll write the initial concentration. The initial concentration of HF is 0 0.100 molar. Before the reaction starts, we don't have any hydrogen or fluoride ions, so those concentrations are zero. For row C, we want the change in the concentrations. We don't know how much the concentrations will change yet, so we'll just write X. We do know that the product concentrations will go up since they can't go down from zero. So the product changes by positive x, and the reactant decreases by x. Now we can write in the equilibrium concentrations, which are these. To find the pH, we need to find the equilibrium concentration of the hydrogen, which is x. As you've seen in the previous videos, to do this, we'll use the equilibrium expression. We have products over reactants, and we plug in the equilibrium values we found. To solve for x, we just need the value of Ka, which we get by looking in appendix D. When we do that, we find out that Ka is 6.8 times 10 to the negative 4. Now we'll solve for x. First, the numerator simplifies to x squared. Next, we move the denominator to the other side of the equal sign by multiplying both sides by 0 0.100 minus x. Finally, we move everything to one side of the equation, which gives us this. This is a quadratic equation, so just as we've done in earlier videos, we can use a programmable calculator or the quadratic formula to solve for x. When we do, we get x equals either 0.00791 or negative 0.00895. 
The negative number is impossible because it would give us a negative concentration for the products. So we use x equals 0 0.00791. We use that in our equation for pH to get a pH of 2.10. So, that's the pH of this solution before we use Le Chatelier's principle to cause the reaction to shift. Let's do that now. Suppose we add 1.00 grams of sodium fluoride to the solution. What'll be the new pH? First, let's think about what will happen to the reaction. Sodium fluoride is soluble, so it'll break up into sodium and fluoride ions. That means there will be more fluoride ions in this reaction and that'll shift the reaction to the left. The sodium ions won't participate in that reaction, so they'll just be spectator ions and we can ignore them. As far as solving this problem, it's not too much different from the problem we did a minute ago. We set up a rice table, and the reaction is the same one that we had last time. The initial concentration of hydrofluoric acid is still 0 0.100 molar. However, this time we need to think a bit about the initial concentrations for the products. We still have no hydrogen ions, but this time we are starting out with some fluoride because of the salt we added. In order to find the initial fluoride concentration, we need to know how many moles of fluoride we have. There's 1.00 grams of sodium fluoride. And if we use the periodic table, we find out that the molecular weight of sodium fluoride is 41.9882 grams per mole. We put the mass in the denominator so that the grams cancel out, and that gives us 0 0.0238 moles of sodium fluoride. There's one fluorine atom for every sodium fluoride molecule, so that means there's also 0 0.0238 moles of fluoride. Now, remember, the rice table wants concentrations, not just moles, so we need the molarity. In this case, that's easy. We have one liter of solution, so the molarity is just the number of moles over one liter, so that's 0 0.0238 molar. Now we can solve the rice table as usual. Since the hydrogen still starts out at zero, we know the products go up by x, and the reactants go down by x. That gives us these equilibrium concentrations. Just like last time, we write the equilibrium expression and we plug the final values into it. Ka is still the same as last time, 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4. This is a slightly more complicated equation than we had last time, but we still solve it the same way. We multiply the two parts of the numerator together, which gives us this. We get rid of the denominator by multiplying the other side of the equation by 0 0.100 minus x, which gives us this. Finally, we move everything to one side of the equation. This is another quadratic equation, and when we solve it, we get x equals either 0 0.00252 or negative 0 0.0270. Just like last time, we can ignore the negative number because it would give us negative concentrations for the products. That means the H plus concentration is 0.00252 molar, and that gives us a pH of 2.60. Let's think about that answer for a minute. Before we added the sodium fluoride, we saw that the solution had a pH of 2.10, and now it has a higher pH. Remember, a higher pH means that the solution is more basic, and that makes sense, because Le Chatelier's principle tells us that adding fluoride should shift the reaction to the left, away from the hydrogen ions. Let's try one more example, a little harder this time. We'll try a solution with base this time. Suppose we have 500 milliliters of a 0 0.400 molar solution of ammonium hydroxide and we add 1.50 grams of solid ammonium phosphate to it. What's the pH of this solution? First, let's think about what will happen when we add the ammonium phosphate. It'll break up into ammonium ions and phosphate ions. The ammonium will make this reaction shift to the left. The phosphate won't take part in that reaction, so it's just a spectator ion. As usual, we'll start by drawing the rice table. Here's the chemical reaction. 
we have 0.400 as the starting concentration of the ammonium hydroxide, and we have zero for the initial concentration of the hydroxide ion. The next thing we need to do is figure out how much ammonium we're adding. We have 1.500 grams of ammonium phosphate, and the periodic table tells us that ammonium phosphate weighs 149.0867 grams per mole. However, unlike last time, we don't want to stop the calculation there. Notice that there are three ammonium ions in every molecule of ammonium phosphate. Since it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, we need to use a conversion factor in our calculation. As we said, there's three ammonium ions in every molecule of ammonium phosphate, so the conversion factor is three to one. Which one goes in the numerator and which in the denominator? Remember, we want the units to cancel, so we need to have moles of ammonium phosphate in the denominator. So, one mole of ammonium phosphate is in the denominator, and three moles of ammonia in the numerator. That gives us a result of 0.03018 moles of ammonium. But we're still not done. Remember, what we want in the rice table is molarity. So we need to take the moles we just calculated and put it over liters of solution. We have 500 milliliters, so that's 0.500 liters. And that gives us a starting concentration of 0.06036 molar for the ammonium ions. Now that we've done that, the rest of the problem will just be another straightforward rice table question. The products increase by x, and the reactants decrease by x, and we get these equilibrium concentrations. Now we write out the equilibrium expression, which is this. We plug in our equilibrium concentrations, and if we look in appendix D, we find out that Kb is equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Now we need to solve for x. We multiply out the numerator and get this. Next, we get rid of the denominator by multiplying both sides of the equation by 0.400 minus x. Finally, we move everything to one side of the equal sign. When we solve this quadratic equation, we get x equals 1.19 times 10 to the negative 4, or negative 0.0605. Once again, the negative number gives us an impossible concentration, so x equals 1.19 times 10 to the minus 4. We're almost done now, but be careful. Remember, we're working with a base in this question, so our reaction has hydroxide in it, not hydrogen ions. That means we're going to calculate the pOH first, not the pH. When we do, we get a pOH of 3.92. As you might remember from video 20, the pH and the pOH always add up to 14, so the pH here is 10.08. The reactions we've been looking at today have some important things in common that I want you to notice. First, they involved a weak acid or a weak base. Le Chatelier's principle wouldn't have worked in these reactions if we had started with a strong acid or strong base, because strong acids and bases dissociate in an irreversible reaction. Adding a salt to one of those couldn't have made a reaction like that shift to the left. Another thing to notice is that the salt we added had an ion in common with the acid or base. In the first reaction, the salt had fluoride ions in it, and so did the acid. In the second reaction, the salt and the base both had ammonium ions in them. So these solutions had two things in common, a weak acid or base, and a salt with an ion in common with the weak acid or base. Those two things are exactly the ingredients you need in order to make a buffer. It turns out that once you combine those two ingredients, it's actually fairly hard to make the pH change anymore. So a buffer solution resists changes to its pH. And that's a good definition of a buffer. A buffer is a solution made up of a weak acid or base and a salt containing an ion in common with the acid or base it resists changes to its pH. So, why do we care so much about buffers? Well, lots of chemical reactions can only take place over a small range of pHs. 
And in addition, lots of cells and single-celled organisms are only able to live at certain pHs, so we need to be able to control the pH of the solutions we use to grow cells or perform chemical reactions. And that's a good place for us to stop for today. In the next video, we'll find out how we can make a buffer that has a specific pH that we want. That way, we can design buffers that are exactly what we need for our experiments. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.